All right, everyone. So I think everyone is just getting settled in. Uh, hope you all enjoyed the intro music that we had playing for you. Um, hopefully it gets everyone in the right mindset. Uh, but I want to uh, thank everyone for being here this afternoon and welcome uh, to Just Women. Uh, today we will be participating in a conversation about navigating intersectionality in the workplace. Uh, my name is Arlene Contreras, she, they, uh, and I am a market response analyst here at JustWorks, uh, as well as the co-lead for our uh, LGBTQI plus uh, employee resource group, Outworks. Uh, and I am super excited and incredibly honored to be the panel moderator uh, for today. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about intersectionality and oftentimes, you know, we all come to work with our own experiences of discrimination, oppression, um, hardships, uh, but oftentimes for women of color, the intersection of race and gender um, presents its own unique challenges. Um, and so today we brought together four truly incredible uh, panelists to discuss these challenges and how they've navigated it in the workplace from you know, beginning as many of us as individual contributors and moving up to C-suite level positions um, and being able to, to share these incredible stories. Uh, so in the back half of this event, we'll start off with seeing some pre, um, you know, pre-designated questions, also some pre-submitted questions uh, that were sent. So thank you all who, who sent in questions beforehand. Um, but we'll also be monitoring the chat. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the event, please feel free to, to chat them. Uh, also, if you want to ask a question anonymously, uh, you're more than welcome to Slack Cassidy and Cassidy will make sure that, that your question is able to be asked uh, anonymously if, if you choose. Uh, we will also, at the end of this, be sending out a recap and a recording of this entire webinar. So if something comes up and you have to hop off early or you know a coworker who unfortunately wasn't able to attend, you can uh, send them over the recording and um, you know, feel free to listen to these amazing words over and over because I know that's, that's what I'll be doing uh, later down the line. Uh, but yeah, so enough about, about me talking. I think it's time for us to um, meet our incredible panelists for today. So I will start off with uh, Gabby Salzberger. Um, well, hi. Um, so I'm Gabby Salzberger, uh, she, her. Um, and um, I'm the newest board member of Just Work. So I think many of you have met me um, in the fireside that I did with Isaac a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and I'm super excited to be uh, joining Just Works. Um, and just a little more about me is that my background's in finance and private equity. And so I've been doing that for a long, long time. Um, and I've also been doing a lot of different um, boards. And so um, I was the chairman of the board of Whole Foods when we sold it to Amazon. And um, I've done a number of other boards. I'm on the board of MasterCard now. Um, I'm also on the board of Ford Foundation and Sesame Street, which um, is awful fun. And just a bunch of other um, private companies like JustWorks. So and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much, Gabby. Next up, we have Courtney Caldwell. Good morning, everyone. My name's Courtney Caldwell. I'm the co-founder and COO of a beauty tech startup called Shearshare. Uh, but before I jumped into entrepreneurship, which I never thought I would be doing, um, I spent you know, a couple of decades working in B2B tech marketing. So I used to run Oracle's digital strategy and innovations group worldwide, had P&L across five continents and loved what I was doing there. So my life has always been about marketing and making things look and sound appealing and never leaving a lead behind um, and happy to be here today. I'm a, a very um, gracious and grateful just works client of gosh, how many years now, two or three years. And so um, it just gets better every single day. Thank you so much. Courtney. <laughs> uh, and then next up we have Priya Katari. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Priya Kotari. Um, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Creative Market. Uh, Creative Market is a design um, marketplace. It's a marketplace for digital designs assets specifically. So fonts, graphics, templates, things of that nature. Uh, and I started my career in marketing and transitioned into project management, into operations, and had you know, similarly didn't see myself as a C-level executive at any point in where I thought I could be going, but I'm really grateful uh, grateful to be on this panel and, and amongst these women who I already look up to and I know I will learn from as well. So happy to be here. Excellent, thank you so much, Priya. And last but definitely uh, not least, we have Mara Lighty. Hi everyone, I'm super grateful to be here. I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of Shine. We are the leading self-care app with the mission of increasing representation and inclusion in this mental health and wellness space. Um, I've been at Shine now for four and a half years and prior to that had, you know, did social media. I was at a nonprofit for a while and I met my co-founder at, at that nonprofit and um, really found that even though neither of us thought we could ever be entrepreneurs or necessarily even wanted to be entrepreneurs, that there was um, so much value in our voices being heard and voices like ours um, and people like us really stepping up and, um, and, and starting their own company. So excited to talk about that journey. And we're obsessed with JetsWorks. We couldn't figure out our PPO system for a long, long time. And then when we found JetsWorks, it was made our life was made a lot better. So um, that's my just works plug, but excited to be here. Excellent. Thank you so much. And um, I know that, that everyone is excited to have you here, uh, but I especially am extremely, extremely excited to have you here and, and be driving this conversation. Uh, so before we begin, um, I'd like to start things off with a brief overview of, of intersectionality uh, because uh, it might be a term that you haven't heard before or might have heard um, but are not sure exactly what it means. I know that it was a term that was introduced to me not that long ago, so I'm still learning a lot about intersectionality. Um, but Kimberly Crenshaw introduced uh, the theory of intersectionality over 30 years ago uh, as a lens or a prism for seeing the way in which various forms of inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other. Um, because I think we all know that it's never just one thing. It's one thing and, and one thing and. Um, so, so it's the complex cumulative way in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination, so racism, sexism, classism, uh, combine, oftentimes overlap, overcome, and intersect with each other uh, for, marginalized, for marginalized individuals uh, and groups. Um, so again, just this idea of it's, it's not just one thing. Um, we oftentimes are uh, all the pieces of ourselves that come together. Uh, so with that in mind, you know, I'd love to hear from each of you uh, about how you identify and how your identity has impacted the way which, which you navigate your career um, and the subsequent life after that. And, and if, Okoye, I'd like to start with Courtney. I think you're muted, Courtney, I'm sorry. Thank you. I was just giving everyone the secret to life. Uh, I just happened to be on mute. Um, <laughs> thank you for framing, um, you know, the definition of intersectionality. I think that's so important. Uh, you know, looking at me, like people wouldn't assume that, um, you know, I have Native American blood running through me or German blood running through me, right? Um, the world um, that we live in every day, I present to the external factors as Black female or African American female. And so for me, um, you know, understanding, you know, the different nuances that make up who Courtney is, you know, has really led me down a very interesting path in life. Um, I am first a, uh, a daughter to a military um, airman. So my dad uh, served as a doctor in the military. My son is actually a second year cadet and football player at the Air Force Academy. Um, my brother works uh, in the Army Research Labs, and so we are a military family, obviously. I'm kind of the black sheep in the family since I'm not active duty, um, but they, they, they still accept me. I'm still written into the will. Uh, and so my experience, though, in life was always being taken from one environment, like every couple of years, and then plopped into a brand new one. And so I kind of had to grow up becoming a chameleon of sorts. Um, and I love that. Um, I didn't realize how helpful that would become in my day to day, you know, as I progressed through, you know, corporate America, made my way into becoming now a startup founder um, or a tech, uh, tech startup founder. 
And I'm so very grateful though for those opportunities because it taught me um, to really appreciate different cultures. Like every day, every year, I was surrounded by people who did not look like me. And that was never um, you know, a concern of mine. It was never, uh, I never felt like out of place. It always felt like very natural to me. It was always my default to be around a lot of people who didn't um, you know, look like me or talk like me or have the same background or culture that I came from. And I really remember, you know, as I continued through corporate America, uh, identifying with groups like that. So like all the time if I was at Oracle, if I had been working at Right Now Technologies or various tech companies, I always sought out groups where people didn't look like me because I always wanted to learn more. It always felt like, you know, home base for me to be, again, be surrounded with people with different thoughts and different perspectives who could bring a different, um, you know, mindset to a particular problem that we're solving or different goals that the company had as a whole. Um, and so I'm, I'm very uh, grateful for that time that I had growing up, experiencing that day to day, because all it did was inform who I am today. Um, now, how people see me generally is, again, as black female, if I'm walking down the street, people would say, oh, she's African-American female. And I learned, you know, walking into different rooms that, you know, I would have to edit myself, unfortunately. Right. So, you know, it, it always felt that if I was walking into a room that was generally white male or white female that I could never be wholly myself. Um, it was never like a spoken rule. It was always this unspoken rule. And so walking in, I would always have to take stock of who's in there, the different energies, the different spirits, the different personalities, and then edit myself accordingly so that whatever it is that I was coming to the table with could be heard. Um, and I never felt that I could be 100% Courtney until honestly, you know, I left corporate America and created my own environment that was safe and healthy. Thank you so much, uh, Courtney. Uh, so I'd like to continue with Gabby. If you would like to answer the question. I know I seem to be like surprising everyone. It's like, you know, everyone's like, oh, my. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, so, um, so my identity has kind of evolved actually. You know, I, I don't know that identity stays the same for your whole life. Um, but I'm first and foremost a black woman. Um, I think over time, I'm also bicultural, and so I've appreciated over time that bicultural wasn't a thing um, for me early on. It wasn't a thing at all. And so, um, but I have appreciated, you know, in, in this last 25 years, the ways that also my identity as bicultural is really important. Um, and I'm also somebody really of a very strong faith. And so that is very much um, kind of guided my life and my career. Um, and I'm a mom, that's probably the other major. Um, so those are the things that have affected me most in my day to day at work. And, um, and there's a lot that uh, we could say on this topic, we could spend the whole panel talking about, you know, how we've had to navigate, you know, the challenges, and also the opportunities that I think come along with our um, identity. And so I think I'd rather like just focus a little bit on the, the latter. Um, and, and maybe even by way of an example, which is uh, how I got on my first board, which was Whole Foods, um, was um, many years prior, like 25, I had been working with somebody at Bain and Company, the consulting firm, and I was on this case team. And, you know, I was like, I mean, I did a good job. I was, a, but um, during those years, I was the only black woman. There was only two black people at Bain, and there was a guy and who I eventually married, and um, myself. <laughs> and so I don't know. We kind of stuck out. We found one another. Um, but anyway, um, so um, uh, worked at Bain. Worked on that assignment with this guy. Twenty-five years later. Um, I get a call about Whole Foods, and they are looking for some a diverse perspective, um, particularly a woman and a foodie and a, a financial person. And lo and behold, it's the uh, chair of the governance committee is this person that I had worked with, you know, 25 years prior. And, um, and he remembered me. And so the whole point of that is, um, you know, there are a lot of challenges about being the only, the only in the room, right? The only black person, the only woman, the um, but there is opportunity that comes out of that, which is that they remember you, you know, and so kind of like on you, like it's all the more reason why how you show up really does 
matter um, because they, they do remember. Um, but there is a lot of opportunity that does come along with that as well. And so um, there are challenges that no doubt, and I'm sure we will be talking about, um, you know, uh, the ways it's difficult, but, th but there is, I, I, I'm also here to say that there is sometimes opportunity by, by, by um, the fact that, you know, you have the opportunity to be singular. So. Uh, I think it's, it's very impactful and powerful because oftentimes we think of our singularity as a detriment and it's like amazing how that could possibly be turned into our biggest asset. So that, that's incredible. Thank you so much, Gabby. Uh, I want to provide Mara opportunity to just tell us more. Yeah, and, and again, I appreciate that you gave that definition of intersectionality. And um, I think what was multiple things that were important in that and that is that there's so many pieces of it and that it's not necessarily about just your identity, but how the world accepts your identity, right? Like Chris Rock has this great quote from 2016 where he talks about how like Barack Obama, we didn't just all of a sudden have the first black man that was like fit to be president, right? Or person that was fit to be president. And black people didn't make progress. It was that the rest of the, the country made progress and the rest of the world made progress and opened their, their minds and their hearts to the idea of a black president. And so I think when, when I think about this question in my identity, I certainly think about how my identity has come to light for me and then how it's been, you know, accepted to Gabby's point or rejected in, in other parts of, of my career. Um, so for me, I identify as a black woman. Um, my pronouns are, are she, her. I also identify as multiracial. I identify as someone from a lower socioeconomic background, um, a child of a parent with addiction, which anybody who, who has that in their family knows it does shape a big part of your identity. I also identify as a, a CEO. Um, then there's, you know, my family roles and my role in my partnership. Um, I'll be identifying as a mother shortly, you know, in the coming months. Um, but like many of you, I thank you. Thanks so much. I haven't told so many people. So you all are like some of the first to know. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, you know, like, like so many people, I, I think I have so many different intersections. And when I first entered my career, I'm, you know, to be totally transparent, I, I was with a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. I moved from Savannah, Georgia to New York City. Um, and I, I think I had the baseline assumption that there was, and I, and I have this assumption in so many places in my life, but that there was a right way to do things. And I just had to figure it out. I just had to crack the code. There was one way to do it. And I just had to figure it out. So I started out by suppressing my identity. Um, you know, for me, that looked like hot ironing my hair every day, making as blonde as possible. It's, there's still a little in there, but it was real blonde. Um, lots of, you know, corporate out, whatever felt like it was me fitting into whatever environment that I was in. Um, not talking about my past experiences and how they shaped me. And I did get rewarded for that to some extent, but I also quickly realized that it would never be enough. Um, I would still experience microaggressions and I think with my identity, I don't always present as, you know, to Courtney's point, people don't necessarily automatically see me as a black woman or know that my family is black. And so I have this, you know, kind of burden of passing, which, um, you know, means that I'll, I could be in a lot of situations with managers or coworkers where they feel comfortable sharing their opinions, you know, on, on people like me and, and not knowing that that's how I identify. And so um, in many respects, that's, that was really difficult, you know, navigating that and in others to, to Gabby's point, it, it did come with some upsides, which it, it forced me to work harder and to really build on the resilience I'd built throughout my childhood. Um, and it stayed with me, but I don't think I really understood how much I put myself into these boxes until I started my own company and like just started to breathe a little bit and realize that, you know, it's like undoing the seams when you get home from work, you know, um, but just like realizing like, oh, I've been holding so much in and I've been, you know, holding my breath so much. And, and what would it look like to really just, just be myself, you know, and it started little by little, but just being authentic and, you know, leading in the way that I feel um, speaks to my all those identities I spoke to and sharing stories and you know making space for other people to to live in that space as well and whatever that looks like for them has become really important to me so as much as it's um it's been really uh difficult and I think this this year has brought to light you know so many parts of my intersection and my uh, intersections of my identity 
that have been um, challenging in the way in which society doesn't accept them. I think the empowerment I felt to create that space and that I feel surrounded by, and you know, even this group of women and, and people that I've worked with at, you know, my company and other companies has just been so fulfilling because it is, it's a sense of like, you know, proving yourself and, and proving that, you know, there's so much value in, in really just embracing that whole identity. Thank you so much, Mara. Um, and you brought up a very good point that we will definitely be touching on soon, which is like authenticity. Uh, and so thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. But definitely want to, uh, you know, touch base with Priya and just just hear about your identity, how you identify and, and what comes of that. Uh, absolutely. I um, so identify as a woman, a South Asian woman. Uh, my parents grew up in India. I'm first generation. Um, and, you know, one of the areas I think of intersectionality that I think just doesn't get a lot of discussion is really that socioeconomic background, which for us was pretty insecure. Um, and, and it just I defined a lot of the early parts of my career because I, I was just hustling. I just didn't ever want to be stressed about money. Um, it was really hard to grow up that way. And I just, I was very determined to never feel that way. And I think that um, that has a lot to do with a lot of the decisions I made early on. Um, but something that, you know, I, I think because of the discussions people are having today, it's helped me tap into is just how much I was, the environment in which I was raised in really impacted me. Uh, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, for many families I was around, you know, it was the first time to meet anyone of an Indian origin. Um, I was one of the few non-Christians um, in, the, in the community. And, um, you know, I spent, I, I spent a lot of my time and energy just making others feel comfortable and, and kind of blending in. And so I never realized how much that was wired in me and how much I took that with me into my, my, my career. Um, and a lot of my success I can reflect on and say it has a lot to do with the fact that I, uh, I also use the word chameleon, um, like you do, Courtney, in terms of I, I was a chameleon in any new environment I came in and I made sure everyone felt really comfortable. Um, and I really was there to understand what everybody else needed and how they needed to be communicated to in order to achieve my goals. Um, and it was it was a powerful tool for me, but it's a very exhausting tool. Um, and it's, it's not at all authentic. And so it's really great to be in the, the most current chapter of my career, or I've been in my position for about three years and I feel, uh, I feel so much more in touch with other parts of myself and my talents. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about of being a woman leader is being able to empower other women leaders. And, uh, you know, I really, I, that part of my identity is one that I think I am a lot more focused on these days because I, I find a lot more opportunity in that and, um, and a lot more empowerment in that than I ever have before. That's great. Uh, no, thank you all so much for sharing. Uh, yeah, I think each, each one of you touched on this very important point. When I often think of intersectionality, uh, I think of all of the pieces that make me authentic, uh, that make me me. Uh, you know, um, I used to joke with my family that when I would go on job interviews, I'd ask them to hire me because I'm a triple minority. I was like, hire me. I can take so many boxes for you with one person. Um, you know, it's like, I'm a woman. I am um, Afro Latina and I'm queer. Like, come on, just let's all just check these boxes. But then walking into certain rooms, you have to figure out, okay, well, which ones can I present forwardly? Um, can, can I make my queerness and, you know, open and honest in this space, but that is who I am. Um, and so this question is, is directed towards Gabby and Courtney. Um, so like what work environment have you been in where you felt you could truly be your authentic self? Uh, and, and what was done to create this safe, healthy, healthy space for you and for those around you? Yeah, um, it's, it's such an important question. Um, and it's hard, you know, um, because there were times in my life when, um, you know, I didn't have the luxury of picking where I was going to work. Like I just needed the job and, you know, it, the culture was really challenging and I had to do some of like what Mara, you know, described, which is to, to kind of, you know, try to make myself fit in. And in, in doing that, um, you know, um, you, you, you do like give up like some parts of yourself, you know, that I think um, that are a loss, like, you know, all around. And so um, as I've gotten to places where I have had more choice and opportunity, um, it's just something that I really do screen for, which is to the extent I can, first of all, finding myself in cultures 
where you know there there is an openness to diverse perspectives and diverse people and you know and 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 to that end i generally try to talk to as many folks as i can before i accept a job or a new board or you know whatever it is just to to get a sense of that um once you're in a, a situation, once you're in a work environment, you know, there are things that you can do. I mean, there's what you, you can, you, you're looking for and, and ways you can hope to change the um, organization. Um, and, um, and then there's just kind of what, you know, I think you as an individual can do. And so for me, partly it's, um, you know, being as conscious as I can about bringing um, my full self. Um, and part of that is, um, earning credibility. Um, and, um, and, and, and then part of it is to the extent I can kind of working with a group of people over time, um, to help them understand sometimes when there are, there are issues that they may not even, you know, be aware of. Like we've all, I think most women have had the, you know, experience of um, making a comment, you know, in a group and then, you know, five minutes later, the guy says something very substantially similar and then everybody's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, you know, uh, so finding the opportunities to gently kind of call that out and kind of correct for that and, you know, I mean, it, it's not ideal. Like what you really want is to have an organization where that's happening from other places. And I think, you know, it just works. We, we genuinely have leadership that cares deeply about this and a strong intent to, you know, to, to create this kind of culture and environment. Um, but I think part of your question is what can we each do as our own part, you know, in helping to make that happen? And it's not easy. I mean, it's just hard enough being a great employee. But, but there are little things you can do along the way that can help. Um, and, you know, um, and I think out of it, for me at least, I've also grown. Um, so, but it's, but it is not easy. Great point, Gabby. Oh, goodness, let's see. Um, that's a really good question though, honestly, Arlene. Um, the work environments that I felt that I could be my authentic self. I mean, like a hundred percent, like a hundred and ten percent authentically, Courtney. I honestly had to create that, and I know that's not everyone's um, journey in life, right? Like, not everyone uh, aspires to be a startup founder or to be, um, you know, the CEO of their own company. But if I had to go back and think about where at least I could have been like 90% authentically me, um, I would say two places. One was when I was working in full-time ministry and not a lot of people know that I worked in full-time ministry for about four or five years. Um, and I felt like I could be authentically me because it's like the, the color was not one of the aspects that was presented every day, right? Like I walk into a room or the teams will walk into a room and we're talking about the bigger goal of, how do we share, you know, Christ with as many people as possible? And so, because that was like the number one goal, um, you know, the, the fact that someone was black or Hispanic or identified as Asian American or whatever, that was not, that was like a non-question. And so I did feel more comfortable in those spaces. Um, the second one um, I think about um, when I was at Oracle, and I think I felt the most comfortable because, again, I was, you know, traveling to Tokyo and traveling to Bangalore, India and traveling to the UK and traveling to South America, where, you know, those groups of people, my team members in those areas, um, they weren't watching the regular news in America, right? So they didn't see how... Um, the betterment of the American society treats the average black person, right? So that I wasn't um, you know, a default, you know, black person. I wasn't someone who was going to go into a bank and rob them, or I wasn't someone who that they, they need to be fearful of. And so because I didn't have that perspective of what a black female should be, I was able to be, you know, a hundred percent Courtney. And so, um, that was very refreshing to be, to be able to serve in those types of environments, because when you are able to stand up proudly and say, you know, this is me and to come to the table with everything that is uniquely you, um, you know, so much of the business, so much of the team, 
so much of your home life, you know, actually, you know, grows and prospers because of that. Uh, and I, I love one of the quotes that one of our investors, um, Arlen Hamilton of Backstage Capital, she always says, it's so important to be uniquely you so that the people who are looking for you can find you. Because if you're trying to fit in, and I spent many, many years doing that to Priya's point, you know, coming back home at the end of the day, it felt like you're an exposed nerve. Like there's so much exhaustiveness, you know, in trying to make people feel, you know, um, heard or seen, you know, even when you're not getting that same kind of respect um, back towards you. Um, but, but being able to stand up and say, you know, this is who I am. These are my unique experiences. Yeah, I'm a military brat. Yeah, I used to move every two years. Yes, I love to travel. I'm a little bit of a foodie, not as much as you, Gabby, but a little bit of a foodie. Um, you know, military is a big part of my how I identify. And, and so bringing all of that to the table, um, it just allows you to be so much more uh, at, at peace with yourself for one, but then because you are at peace with yourself, you're then able to give so much more back to, you know, whatever it is that you're serving. I remember when um, I was working in tech marketing, this must have been like early 2000s and or mid 2000s. And I used to think, you know, I can't come into the room, you know, because I have a little kid at home and I have all these mommy duties that I'm thinking about. And mom guilt is very, very real. You know, you feel like you feel like so bad when your son is the last person to be picked up at school or daycare. Right. And they're just looking at you, with those baby dog eyes like like, why? Why am I always the last person to be picked up? It's like because mommy was working. But I always felt that I couldn't start the conversation with Courtney identifies as a mom. I didn't want people to see me. And then all of a sudden, you know, oh, she's a mom first. But but then I started to realize like I have a really good I don't know, call it knack or just innate ability to be able to nurture teams. And I think some of that stems from being a mom, right? Like you are grooming something out of nothing. You are building, you know, a person, like literally building a person, another human being to give back to the world. And when I realized that I could be that and take that part of me to work, I mean, I think my, my team life for sure flourished and I was able to, you know, become, you know, manager and come director and people, you know, would trust me and team members would listen and people would want to give more, you know, working um, with me as their, as their, uh, dep excuse me, department head, because they felt that they felt a safe space. Um, and so it took me a long time to recognize that I could be, you know, authentically me, which meant being that nurturer. Um, but I'm so very glad that I did, because even now today, at Shearshare, Share, one of our mantras, our, our number one mantra is something that we took from um, our family environment. And my husband is my co-founder, by the way, which I think is the best thing ever. Uh, and some people would not stand to work with their spouses, but I, I love it every day. I never have to think about if is he getting more equity than I am. Um, and so one of the mantras that we ascribe to at Shearshare, Share, as well as our family, is that you have to leave people, places, and things better off than when you found them. And, you know, that's something that was muddled over, you know, in, in my family life that I was able to take into work and take into sheer share and take into all parts of me. Um, and that's, that's been um, very healthful and helps me to always stay mindful. No, oh, those are incredible points. Um, it, it, it makes me think of one of my favorite uh, quotes. Um, that starts off with our biggest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our biggest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Because at the end of it, it says, when you shine your light, you unconsciously give others permission to do the same. Mm -hmm. And um, that, uh, you know, speaks volumes, right? It, it is that sense of how can you shine your light and let others know that that is possible for them to continue to do the same. So, so this question is for Mara and Priya. Um, and I would like to take a note just for time. Um, after this question, I would like to open it up to live Q&A. So if you do have any questions that have been burning uh, in your heart to ask, please drop it in the chat and I'm happy to make sure we get to those. Uh, but, but in the point of, of just remaining authentic, you know, Mara and Priya, as, as a leader, you know, how, how do you maintain your own authenticity? And then how do you also make space within your own companies to make sure that everyone around you feels comfortable and safe maintaining theirs as well? Um, I, I really love this question. And by the way, I'm just so excited to watch this recording later because it's like, you know, what I want to listen to every morning is these amazing human beings. Um, this is just so inspiring. But um, I do, I really love this question because I think that um, when I, for, you know, to, as a leader, like when I first started Shine, I would just kind of go into the workday. I mean, I would start my day with like, 
you know, leadership podcasts and startup podcasts. And I just found myself like, you know, it's almost like this level of competition. Like, how can I just learn all the things I can learn again so I can like do it the right way? And that left me like feeling, uh, you know, starting my day from a place of, um, I would say like inadequacy versus abundance. You know, I, I was starting my day comparing myself versus like really focusing on myself and tapping into kind of my true energy and essence. And so now I start my day with, you know, Oprah and like, you know, obviously the shine app and like what a, journaling, like what are the things that help me to tap into how I'm really feeling? And that doesn't mean my days are peachy. It means that I'm, if I'm having a rough day, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be able to tap into that and not just like run into the day without first checking in with myself. And then I think it's about giving that vulnerability and transparency and like transferring that to the team, not being afraid to be honest about where I'm at. Um, so at Shine, we have a value called 100 to 100. Um, and what that means is a lot of relationships we like to think are, are 50, 50. Um, but the problem with 50, 50 is like, it assumes like I got to be fully 50. You got to be fully 50. We can't have an off day. I can't have an off moment. Let's say I show up, you know, 30 minutes late for brunch or don't text you back for two days. What happens with that is I, I only came 20%, maybe 30%. And maybe you're coming your full 50%, but then you start to make up narratives in between that space, right? Like, oh, you know, maybe she's, um, maybe she's mad at me, or uh, maybe there's something wrong with me. Did I do something? Did I say something, right? It starts to create narratives and animosity. And that can happen at work, right? Like when something kind of falls through. And so the idea with 100 to 100 is that I'm going to come fully to you and either let you know that I'm just off and I'm not going to be in my best place, or I'm going to come fully to you and check in, right? And say, hey, I noticed I haven't heard from you in a bit. No need to respond, but I'm thinking about you, right? Like that's 100 to 100. And so at Shine, how do we create space for 100 to 100? We um, have these weekly meetings like our OKR meeting where we're checking in on goals. We start that meeting with gratitude every week. And what that means is everybody just goes around and says a quick thing they're grateful for. It can be the weather. It can be a good day. But it can also be, you know, just honestly where they're at. Um, similarly, all of our one-on-ones with managers are just, they start with human check-ins, like how, how are we both really doing? Um, which means that if I'm emotional, you know, as, as the founder of the company and just as a human being over another police brutality case and, and how it's affecting me and my family, I'm real about that and I'm talking about that. Um, when my aunt uh, passed away from COVID after many failed attempts to be taken seriously in her healthcare um, process, an issue that's so common for Black women, um, I shared that with the team. Uh, you know, the, yesterday we had a team member just share her experience, you know, living in Seattle and with the wildfires and what that's been like. And that, that space is about, you know, we started talking about identity and our intersections. And, and then to your point, Arlene, of authenticity, like to be our authentic selves, we have to feel that we don't have to come to work like with a smile plastered on our face and with, um, you know, wearing the shoulder pads and, and feeling like we need to fit into this box that I think corporate America has perpetuated for so many years. You know, if we think of any HR video from the 90s or around that time, it's always like, you're coming to work, you leave, you leave home at home and you're smiling and you're like, how are you? Good, you good. And that's just, it's just BS. And we all know it's BS and, but we all, you know, we tried it. And I think particularly for marginalized communities, it hurt us the most. Um, but I think it's time that we just, you know, to that point of hundred to hundred, like our value is actually that we keep it 100 because if you're able to be honest and authentic and assume that other people are also going to do that, you, you also, as, as a woman, don't have to caretake as much because you can assume that other people are going to let you know that when they're off or that they need support or that they need help. You know, it's just this creates this environment of trust. So I think, you know, for us, we all have to remember that perfectionism is rooted in white supremacy and that we all just have off days and that we are, are human beings and our identity and, and society's either, you know, again, acceptance or rejection of that on a given day is going to elevate us or, or make us, again, just, just um, deterred for that moment or that day. So, um, yeah, I would say that that's, that's one way that we create that environment and just trying to show up as authentically as I can myself every day. You know, for me, um, 
I think what happened uh, for me in particular is that I uh, had an opportunity to join my first leadership team. And when I joined that team, I was overwhelmed by how immature and selfish and passive aggressive that environment was. And I was just like really trying to navigate it. And at some point, I kind of erupted in authenticity because I just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> and I just like had a couple of conversations where I just like let it all out um, to the CEO. Uh, and um, like in one particular conversation, I was like, this place is so messed up. I was like, I have a list in my one note about everything that's wrong with this place. And he was like, what are you doing sitting on that list? Like send me that list. And so I started to get rewarded for my authenticity. There, he really showed me like there was so much gold in all of that um, and being able to kind of speak directly and um, and be able to call things out, you know, obviously respectfully, but, uh, you know, be solutions oriented um, was uh, really kind of the call to action there. Um, and I just, I, I just learned that there was something in that I had to offer that I didn't realize was really important to others and could have an impact on the company. So I have the luxury of time um, in my current position. I've been at my company for six years. I think that I've over six years built up um, to Gabby's point. Credibility is a really big part of how you can start to feel uh, more comfortable being authentic. Um, so I've built that credibility to where I can really show up as myself. So a lot of what I really try to do is help others be authentic. Um, I find a lot that, you know, people that are new in leadership, they, they really do a lot to present themselves as leaders, which make them less authentic. Uh, so I, I've spent a lot of time in one-on-ones, um, being curious about them and being really open myself about what my challenges are, you know, you know, really showing them like, hey, I, I may be you know, in a higher position than you, but I also have challenges. Let me share them with you. Uh, really sharing a lot about, you know, mistakes that I've made and what I've learned from them, things like that. Just go out of my way to do that so that I can start to break down those walls and kind of create a more open and vulnerable dialogue between the two of us, um, which creates more authenticity. And I, I'm always more comfortable being authentic if others around me are being authentic. And so uh, I really try to go out of my way to, to, build the relationships, build the trust that kind of lead to those authentic interactions and, and frankly, just better discussions about how to run a business once you get there. So uh, those are, those are the things that I do. I think that, I think that being really curious and being really transparent um, is just really what it comes down to. And it's helped me a lot in trying to build that environment. And I'm not perfectly successful, uh, but I really, uh, I really do think that it has helped help create a more real company. And, and, you know, we build it into our values, you know, similar to Tamara's company. We have a value at our company called say the thing, which is really about like, don't sugarcoat it. Let's just, let's just say the thing. And so uh, that also has uh, given people, I think, a permission to be authentic. Um, and that, that has helped a lot. Priya, I, I wish you were at Gucci with your running list of one notes before they came out with that turtleneck. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could have called that out a lot earlier and said, I don't think that's going to go over. Somebody needs well. to tell you. <laughs> I have to now go see this turtleneck. I haven't seen it. Oh, boy. Oh. Um, <laughs> no, but, but um, one thing, this is one of our pre-submitted questions, but one thing that you, you slightly touched on here, Mara, is, you know, oftentimes, sometimes being authentic can be exhausting. Um, like, you know, having to always present yourself as your true self while others are like only coming in halfway or not the whole way, um, you know, can get exhausting. And, and I feel, especially for women of color, that's one of, one of the biggest things that drains us is just like, oh, wow, now I have to like take care of myself and call you out and, and do all of these things and put in that, right? Yes, put in that extra effort and move that forward. Um, and oftentimes that onus is on us, right? It's, it's always just like, well, why don't you tell me what I'm doing wrong? And it's like, well, why don't you figure this out, you know? And so throughout your career, and this is, this is open to anyone, um, throughout your career, what boundaries, right? Because I feel like now with the lines blurred between home and work and work and home and all being in one place, boundaries have been have become so much harder to set. Uh, so I'm curious to know throughout your career, um, beginning from, from the start all the, all the way to, to your current level, what boundaries have you put in place to preserve your emotional energy that I feel is what is used to, to, to be your authentic self moving forward? And, and what recommendations do you have for, for our team about this, especially considering um, you know, everything that's going on in the world and everything that we have to manage and think about at all times? That's... That's really good, Arlene. Gabby, were you going to say something? I didn't want to overstep if you were going to respond. No, no, okay. Go ahead. Um, the, the first thing I think about is 
like regardless of if you're running your own company or if you're working somewhere else and you have a you know journey forward to get up that corporate ladder i think you have to first remember that like the business is only as healthy as you are your department that you're overseeing is only as healthy as you are my company share share is only as healthy as i am and so I think it's very important to do the work first of figuring out, okay, so what does that look like for me? And for me, I know I have to do five things well every single day. And if I don't, you know, something suffers, including my own self, uh, self care. I have to make sure that I'm hydrating well. That's why I make sure on these zoom calls, like I come prepared with yes, tons of water. And one of my mentors told me that wine does not count. So I'm trying to stick with water. Um, so I have to hydrate well. I have to eat well. Um, my husband and I are actually uh, vegan, and, and that's a long story in itself about how we got to that road. Um, but that helps me to have so much clarity of thought. Like I feel like I don't get tired as much as I used to when I used to eat, you know, other things. I don't. Um, I just feel totally differently. Just the way I even process like emotions and thoughts just is differently. So I have to hydrate well. I have to eat well. I know I have to be moving, you know, some kind of way, even if it just means I'm taking the dog around the block um, one time a day, you know, I have to get out and get that body up from these Zoom calls and from behind the computer. Um, I also have to sleep well. For some people, that means five hours a night. For some people like myself, I need at least seven and a half hours of sleep, but I don't have to get it at the same time. I can get three hours here and I can, I'm that kind of person who can wake up and work two hours and then go back to sleep for the other three and a half hours. My husband, completely different. He has to get eight hours of sleep all in one swath and if not, he's not his best self the next day and then we we'll have to socialize well i got to find time to get up from talking about sheer sheer talking about the business talking about COVID 19 talking about another black man being shot talking about i have to be able to dissociate from that for a minute and be able to just say hey friend of mine how are you doing today oh you know oh that's that's great your kid you know got a tooth that's wonderful like i have to be able to just have those random heart feeling feel good kind of conversations and if i know that i'm doing those five things well then i know i'm being able to give my best authentic self to whatever it is that's ahead of me business or whatever goal that i've set and i guess i, I would just um add to that because you know we each have our our things um, and, um, and, you know, it's kind of like they say on the plane, you know, in order to take care of others, you got to like take the, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Um, and so that's true at home and, and it's, it's true at work. Um, and, and, but sometimes it is easier to say that than it is to do that. And, um, but it is really important if your list is five things or three things or whatever those things are that are about self-care for you, it is really, um, important. And, and I think the thing that I would just kind of overlay, oh, sorry, distracted by a really cute dog. Um, uh, having a good dog is also part of self-care. But um, it, I would overlay on top of that is that um, I, I think that we can be really hard on ourselves, you know, and, um, and I've said this before, I have two daughters who are both in their 20s, you know, and um, and as a single working mom, like I always felt like, you know, I wasn't like an A plus as a mom because I was having to make these trade offs and I wasn't an A plus in the office because I was having to, you know, and, and, you know, and I'm an A plus kind of person, you know, so like, but I was always hard on like what I wasn't doing as well as I theoretically should have, you know, and the truth is it's a, it's not a sprint, it is a marathon. And so if you just bring your best self and your best self at home and your best self, you know, at work, you know, over time. Um, and sometimes you have more to give one than to the other and vice versa. Um, but, you know, you, you just can only do the best you can do um, and, and, and try not to be hard on yourself. And so that is like a, something I would say to my younger self now um, that, um, you know, is, is an important part of self-care. I love that, Gabby. Um, and Courtney, I was like frantically writing down your list because I'm like, whatever she is doing, I must do. Um, I definitely need to work on hydrating. But um, I, I do think, Arlene, one of the things I, I loved about what you said was that it is, it can be exhausting, like showing up as your authentic self. So one thing I just wanted to share with everyone, if it's helpful, because sometimes it is helpful to name things, is there is this concept of representation burnout, which speaks to the exhaustion and, um, you know, stress that comes from being the only one and just continuing to like represent whatever that looks like in your in your space and so we certainly felt that as, as two women of color and 
you know, the VC space, fundraising, all the things. And so it's just some boundaries that my co-founder and I set after we learned, after some time, after we learned what we needed, um, was one thing was like events, like just like physical spaces, which I know, you know, right now isn't as much of a thing, but certainly, um, you know, there are conference calls and, and things that, um, you know, are optional. And so just the spaces that we just knew were gonna be like 99.9% .9 people that didn't look like us, we stopped going to, you know, even if it was encouraged by an investor, if it wasn't required, it's just something that we just took that physical boundary of, of if this feels like a space that's going to leave us feeling even more exhausted after a long day, we're not going to, we're not going to go to it. Um, we took for us, you know, side hustling certainly meant that we, we were working, you know, more hours than a typical 40 hour work week, but we made sure that we had that certain boundary. And for us, it was Saturdays that there was no, communication allowed no no phone calls don't slack me nothing um and so whatever that looks like for you within in your day-to-day -day work um environment and then i think um just two last things one of them is that we learned how to shift from kind of apologizing for i don't know not getting back to an email quickly enough or um being really focused on a project right like oh we're just so busy right moving from like sorry i'm so busy ugh, to i'm just really focused right now like i've just i'm really focused I don't have time for this, you know, or I, I didn't have time for this and now I do. Um, and so I think that just, again, moves from this like idea of like, there's a right way to be and you're apologizing for not being that right way to just saying like, I'm doing a lot of really important things and, and this is what I'm capable of and I have bandwidth for right now. And then lastly, to the point of, of starting my day with myself, I think we've all woken up and checked our email first thing. And even if it's like, not the intention of the person it's you know 8 a.m and you're just like Ugh, like whatever whatever that is right even if you're just annoyed that you're getting emails right like we all have have had that and that's why you know just as much as you can avoid starting your day in a reaction place like starting your day reacting to other things but instead creating or being proactive in some way for for just yourself because it you know and everybody has a different time of the day where they're um, more centered, but I would just say that the the mindset that you set for the day and if you prioritize yourself It does set a precedent and it sets a tone and it also is an indicator to other people um, of, of You know how much of their uh, your time is theirs versus yours And so I think as much as you can start your day with yourself whether that's like, you know podcasts again journaling just breathing for five minutes um, versus reacting I think that's that's definitely been a game changer yeah. And I'll just add, you know, like I, I've definitely, I deal with FOMO. And so I really had to like have a talk with myself about my phone notifications and just be like, it's cool. Like you can you can like engage in these things later. So I think phone notifications is just a, a really real place to set boundaries. Uh, the uh, other thing that I would say is I, you know, I used to live in the Bay area and I think the hard part about the culture out there was just really how much you were defined by what you do, what your career was. And so I, you know, I left the Bay Area. And one of the reasons I was happy to make that move was because I, I want to go to have dinner with someone and talk about anything else other than work. Um, and I like very specifically reach out to my friends that are in totally different industries because I just don't want to talk about, if I do want to talk about work, I don't want to like really talk about it. I just want to like share a quick thing and then like not have to be like, so have you guys thought about, like, it's just so important for me to like talk to people that are just completely outside of tech um, uh, because I, I get so sucked into the world and I, I feel too important inside this world than um, it actually is at times. So. Uh, those are a couple of things I, I really try to do. If I could just add one more thing, Arlene and Gabby, you may have some fillers in here as well, since our kiddos are uh, a little less dependent on us from a day to day basis. But I think it's so important for us to realize that it's OK, guys, to staff your weaknesses. It's OK that if I don't want to spend all day Saturday, tomorrow's point, cleaning my house, that maybe I will choose to pay someone who loves doing that one thing. Right. And that's going to give me back so much mental and emotional like capacity to be able to move forward. Same thing at Share Share. I don't want to be the numbers person. I don't want to be the finance accounting forecasting the next, you know, seven quarters. I don't want to be that person. My Strength is not that. So let me run in my lane and run holistically, authentically down this one path. And then I'm going to give that other role to someone who loves to do that. You know, that opens up, you know, not only your own mindset, but it also gives someone who loves that another opportunity to, to shine. Thank you so much for adding that, Courtney. Um, and 
you know, I wish I could have this conversation for hours. Um, if you randomly all receive an email from me later about a Zoom call, just accept it. Don't worry. We'll talk. It won't be recorded. No. Um, but we're, we're almost just about out of, out of time. So I just wanted to give um, each of you an opportunity for some final words. Uh, Mara, I'll start off with yours. Um, start your day with shine. You know, help, help that. So, so you might have to, you know, if that was, if that was going to be it, you might want to think of something else. Um, but I just really want to, want to give you all, um, you know, some final last words uh, that everyone can take away from this um, but before we close it out. So uh, let's start with Priya. Sure. Um, you know, I think for people that are attending this, when you think about, you know, the kinds of companies you want to work at, you're not going to work at JustWorks forever. You're going to go work somewhere else at some point. And um, one thing I'd really encourage everyone to do is when you're learning about the other companies you want to join, don't just evaluate the company culture, evaluate its subcultures um, and really specifically evaluate the leadership cultures because it always trickles down um, and that culture will impact you day to day more than anything else. So think about the things you care a lot about and uh, the type of company you want to be a part of and, and really dig into what that leadership culture is to make sure that feels aligned with what you want to do and where you want to be. Yeah. Um, I'll go next, um, and, um, and and uh, I, partly I'm just saying this because you know I'm one of the I am the oldest person on this panel and possibly in this whole group um, on the Zoom today, and um, um, and, and it's something that we have been touching on in this last part of the conversation, which is self care. Um, but um, you know I've uh, been through you know some challenging times. You know we had 9/11 and we've and this is really an extraordinary time that we are all going through. And, um, and I have two daughters who are in their 20s, both of them. And, um, and, and I just know, you know, it's an, it's an extraordinary stressful time for me. And I've been through a lot, you know. And um, so, um, so we're all kind of dealing with, and, you know, you've heard stories about, you know, as family members who've been ill or it's, you know, your mom, you're worried about her or, you know, it's what, it, what all this stuff that's going on in your personal life. And now, you know, at work, you're isolated and, you don't have, you know, you don't have the benefit of like, you know, kind of the fun stuff that, you, and it's just hard. And, and we don't exactly know how long it's going to be. Um, and so it's just all the more like the stuff that we've been saying around self care, right and through here and not being hard on yourself is really, really important. This is an extraordinary time. And um, just works is a it is a an unusual company in the amount, you know, to which it really cares so deeply about all of you, um, all of us. Um, and so th there's a lot of support here and, and all that's true. And it's still just really hard. So like the extent to which we can self care right in through here is just so, so important. And, um, um, and, and I'm reminded of that every day. And so, you know, um, so really that is the message that I would just leave behind that it's, you know, it's especially now that this is an, a really unusual time. It's going to get better. This too shall pass. Mm -hmm. But in the in the interim, you know, um, let folks know when you, you you need the support. There's there is support here, um, and and um, do do what you need to do to take care of yourself. I felt that in my spirit, Gabby. Mm -hmm. um, so, so every day, you know, our team at Shearshare um, works to keep small businesses open. And I don't think I, I kind of shared that with you guys. Um, so we serve stylists and salon and barbershop owner community, right? So if you have empty space in your salon or shop, you can list it for free on the Shearshare app and a stylist is able to rent your space by the day. So we're affectionately known in our industry as hair B&B. And so it's important for us every day, like when I think about the future people that we're hiring when I think about people who are pouring into us um, as executives within the company um, and just like in, in life in general that you know they understand you know the problem that we're trying to solve because it disproportionately impacts lots of females like our our market is like 75 percent female and so when we think about different team members who are joining the share share mission you know do they have a heart for that like what I don't even really care as much about their IQ as I do about their EQ and we actually screen for that before we um, bring somebody on to the team. But then also, I think just from an allyship perspective, how you could help kind of boost the signal with like a nonverbal cue is by mentoring. Um, and so what that looks like in my life even is that I always, going back to my um, ministry days, I always have to have a Ruth in my life and I always have to have a Naomi, 
right? So that Ruth is that mentee, it's somebody that I'm pouring into. And that Naomi person is somebody who's pouring into me, right? And if you constantly have that like cycle going, there's so much goodness then that comes out of that. So. Mm -hmm. I'll go quickly. I would just say, um, yeah, just plus one is so many of things that have been said. And, and the last thing for me would be to just know your power, um, even when it feels like you don't have any. And we've all looked back at times in our career where we realized we, we had a lot more than we thought, um, whether that's power to shift policies, power to ask for what you deserve, power to uplift other people and, and, and tell your story and create space. You have so, so much power within you. And I know it's hard and I know it's exhausting, um, but never feel powerless and know that you do have the power to um, affect real change. So, and remember that this November when you vote. Good point, please vote. <laughs> please. Just once, just once, not twice, just, just one time, okay? Um, but, but we are out of time. Uh, I, I just want to, again, say thank you to each and every one of you, Priya, Mara, Gabby, Courtney, for joining us on this incredible conversation. Again, be on the lookout for an email from me, private chat uh, next time. No, but uh, thank you all for joining. I, I really, truly do hope you all enjoyed this powerful conversation and hopefully got a lot out of it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, please be on the lookout for a follow-up email with additional resources and guides uh, that you can use moving forward through these conversations, uh, as well as a recording. So if you know that anyone that missed it, that would really benefit from it. Feel free to share their way. Uh, and um, there's a great follow-up discussion happening in the Square One uh, Slack channel. So if you want to go ahead and join that in Slack um, to keep boosting your day, feel free to do so. But again, I want to Thank you all for joining us. I hope you have an incredible rest of your Thursday. And uh, yeah, looking forward to keeping the conversations going soon. So thank you all. Kudos to you, Arlene, and the Just Works team. These conversations <laughs> are vital to have. So thank hey. you. And Gabby, you're not the old. Uh, you're not the oldest. This is just a really good skincare routine. I know it doesn't <laughs> like it. It's just really, you know, there's, it's just really held up back. It's, it's hidden in the hair. It's just really pulled back. I promise. I promise. <laughs> thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. It was an honor. Have a great day, guys. Stay safe. Thank you.